Hello and welcome to the latest episode of PSG Talking, a special international break edition, if you will. My name is Ed, and on today's show, we're going to dig up that 2 0 loss to Stad Rene, discuss Killian as captain, and talk about some transfers. To help me do all that, we have once again Ethan from PSG Fan Club Boise. Ethan, welcome to the show. Now, first things first, how is your March Madness bracket doing? Oh, man. It was doing pretty good until last night. Uh, I had Gonzaga winning the whole thing, and they got crushed by UConn. But I know my brother had UConn, I think, winning it. So that was a, that was a, a real test between our brackets, and uh, he got me there. But other than that, uh, my parents are SDSU alums, so the Aztecs are playing right now, and they can make the uh, Final Four. So I would love to see them win it as kind of an underdog. Yeah, what about yours? Yeah, FAU and SDSU. Who would have thought that in a Final Four? Um, yeah, I had Purdue winning it all, so I've been out for a long time. So that pretty much sums up my bracket. Uh, Purdue, the PSG of March Madness. All right, um, Ethan, let's get into this. So um, let's go back. It's about a week ago. PSG's 2-0 defeat to Ren. Um, if you look at the stats, it, it doesn't actually look that bad for PSG. 17 total shots, 8 on target, 60% possession, 90% pass accuracy. So how in the world did PSG get beat so convincingly when they actually played kind of well at times? They created plenty of chances. I mean, what did you see in this one? Yeah, so like you were saying, if you look at the stats, not a bad game. I think we had a higher uh, XG than them, but, uh, you know, XG is only important if, uh, or it only matters if you can actually finish those chances. So, and we just didn't finish our chances. Killian didn't have a good day. Uh, anyone taking a shot just didn't have a good day. And and then Ren really, really pounced on the opportunities that, that they got with that kind of uh, makeshift back line of ours. So, yeah, honestly, I mean, it, people were people were kind of, you know, really criticizing it. And this feels like a real low point of the season. But we're just going to get games like that. Ren historically always play us really well. Uh, the one thing I was predicting a 2-2 draw at the beginning and uh, we had the chance to get our two goals and, you know, they got theirs, but we uh, we just didn't capitalize and we didn't get ours. So I just thought because of Ren's away form hasn't been very good this year. And I, uh, I thought we'd, you know, at least avoid a loss there, you know, maybe get a point out of it. But yeah, just not our day. And then uh, I think the biggest thing was just the injuries to our defense. You know, I love how our midfield and our attack is basically 100 percent healthy. And then the defense, you know, five of our six or seven best defenders are out. So it's uh, it's not the worst. I think the international break came at a pretty good time for us. Definitely. And I think you got to credit uh, our old friend Mendanda there for Ren in goal. I mean, you mentioned they were just didn't take our chances. I think PSG did take their chances pretty well. It was just that Mendanda was there just standing on his head to borrow a hockey term and I mean, we just could not beat him. He, he just was blocking everything, and um, they were set up well. They they knew how to, to play us, and you mentioned Ren seemed to always have our number in these matches coming. But I, I thought, like, coming off of that, you know, just difficult defeat to Bayern Munich, you would think coming back home, the, the team would want to put in a performance. And again, at times, it did seem like they were a little bit inspired, but a 2-0 defeat at home didn't really give much uh, hope to supporters and there was some whistling and some booing and you know it's, it's not what Kim Kardashian came to see now was it no uh I think we we may have got hit with the Kardashian curse there with uh she was at Arsenal's match to see them lose uh, get knocked out of the Europa League on that, that Thursday and then a couple of days later at the park to see us lose so Maybe uh, you know, I'm not I'm not gonna fault her completely for the loss, but maybe she just shouldn't show up to any, any more home games. If if she wants, she can go to uh, La Classique at the Velodrome next year and wear a Marseille jersey if she wants. I wouldn't mind that. Yeah, Kim Kardashian might like the uh, south of France. I could see her down yeah. there. Yeah, it's a nice area. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 
and, and just looking at the starting lineup for PSG, you did have Verratti in the midfield. You had Messi and Mbappe up front. You had Nuno Mendes was out there. Uh, Danilo had been playing well. Vitinha is probably the second best midfielder we have. So we, we talk about injuries and all that, but this was still a team that should be able to beat a side like Ren, who are not lighting the world on fire. Um, I want to talk about Ren, though, for a second, because Ethan, Carl, Toko, Ekambi, He's a Parisian who came up through Paris FC, if I'm not mistaken. And then Arnaud Cal- Calamwendo, who uh, did come up uh, through PSG, the former PSG player. They were the two goal scorers for Ren, And so it's more of the same, isn't it? Players that should be at PSG or used to be at PSG coming back to haunt them. There was a great shot, and I'm sure you, you saw it during the match, of uh, Nasser and Campos sitting next to each other and looking very agitated. Do you think it's finally setting in now that the you know 50th former PSG player has scored against us that maybe they should hang on to these guys do you think it's settling in oh no I I mean I think it is for Campos I I think Campos is smart and I I usually will trust his decision making he's he's proven himself at Monaco and at Lille but Nasser I don't I, I just, it would not surprise me if Nasser still doesn't get it I mean some people, a lot of people disagree with me here, but I still think it was a good idea to uh, sell Cali Muendo. He has not been lighting Liga on fire. But, you know, if if we're going to sell him and then replace him with someone like Ekatike, who if you're going to spend, you know, sell Cali Muendo for whatever, $20 million we sold him for, and then buy Ekatike for, you know, we're going to be spending 35 on him in this summer, you would expect an instant improvement from Ekatike uh, opposed to, you know, compared to what uh, Arnold was doing before, but we haven't seen that. So yeah, it, uh, it, it's, it's kind of a sour uh, a thing for a lot of fans. And I mean, I, I think, you know, Cal window's good, but we look at, um, you know, all these mistakes from the past that, that have really haunted us. I mean, letting Coman go, obviously he scored against us twice in the past three years in the champions league once in you know the final that, that buried us and then in the first leg in uh in paris earlier this season but selling guys like that diaby and uh we had mike Menyan for a while and let all them go and yeah i don't know it's it, it is tough to see those guys score against us and it, it's almost not surprising at this point uh, seeing toko kambi and you know just seeing parisians score against us uh I don't know. It's it's almost a, a weird thing where we're just kind of used to it. I mean, think of an, think of another sport where if if you had a team in another sport and that like your former players were always scoring against you, I just feel like um, I don't know. It, it would just feel cruel, you know. You're just thinking like, what what have we done to to deserve this? But honestly, we kind of do deserve it. Just the the management of the team always trying to buy dudes in their late 20s or 30s only for them to flop and we sell them for a tenth of their price you know later looking at you Adrisa Gay and soon to be Mari Cardi and then yeah getting rid of guys like Mkunku and Diaby whose whose value has quadrupled or or more since we let him go yeah it's it's rough but I, I do think Campos is going to help in uh getting more you know Parisians more French players into the squad I just think it's a process it'll take time yeah, we're going to get to some transfer rumors and some of those are former players that potentially could come back and um, some Parisians or, or those who have ties to France at least. So uh, we're going to get to that here in the second part of the show. But uh, Ethan, looking ahead at the league on schedule for PSG, they've got Leon at home and they've got Nice away and then Lons at home. Uh, PSG has a seven point lead over second place Marseille. So are you still feeling confident about uh, PSG holding on to this lead? in France I think you had predicted 12 points or no how many points did you predict seven or something like that on our last show from the 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 upcoming four games so they didn't get any from the red match so how do you how confident are you and how many points do you think they can realistically get here uh I still think I mean five seems a lot more realistic I think I had predicted seven uh two wins a draw and a loss so there's the loss. I also think we're probably going to lose one more of the other ones. Although I think it really depends on whether our, uh, you know, what kind of who's who's back in in defense. I know you were just talking a little bit ago, and not to focus on the run match too much, but I know we had all the midfield and the attackers there. But if you look at just, I mean, just knowing like football stats, 
uh, your defenders are usually the ones making the most passes in a match. And just guys like Bichiabu, they're not, you know, these these guys that should be depth at, uh, you know, in defense and not starters. They're just not great on the ball. So I think uh, we saw Ren really, really take that um, and and use it. It was clearly in their game plan to press and try and unnerve those guys. And I think they did it well. So I think if we've got guys like Marquinhos and Ramos back, I just, I don't think that game the other day would have been, uh, you know, last week would have been a loss, probably at least a draw, but, I still think uh, I think seven's still realistic. We'll probably win the home games, just because uh, Lons is home, correct? Yeah, they their away form is also really bad. So as long as our back line is not as fragile as as it was, you know, last week, then I think we'll probably win that. And uh, I, I do think it it could get close though, as far as Marseille kind of catching up to us. I think they could get within four points of us because they've got a couple easy games coming up. But they still do have a couple of those tough games kind of spread out at the end of the season. So I think we'll see them get within four or five of us. And then as, you know, the end of the the season for us, pretty easy teams. We're playing a bunch of the teams that are about battling relegation. And we'll, we'll win most of those. Those could but be I, tough, though. Those could be tough. There's uh, I, sides fighting to stay up. They are going to fight us really hard. But I Marseille has enough of those, too, where I think they just – We'll fail to get a goal. So I still think we're going to win the league by, you know, seven points or so. But I do think uh, they'll they'll kind of close the gap there for a little bit. Because, yeah, we, we have our probably three last, you know, tough games of the season back to back to back right after the break. Yeah, I'm just I'm not as optimistic. I, I think Leon at home is a loss. I think Nice is away away is a loss. And I think maybe. Okay, maybe Lons at home is a win. I'm I'm seeing three points. I think originally I'd predicted five points out of the upcoming four games. So with the Ren Lasso, I'm going down to three. I just don't like what I see. I don't know about the injuries. Um, I, I think we got to talk about Juan Bernat. Um, the first goal, a combi. It was him and Danilo. Um, it was a long pass from about midway, and great first touch by a combi, but. Gee, Bernard is just lost. He's a step too slow. If he's out there playing any kind of meaningful minutes for PSG in these upcoming games, I think that's a real problem. He's a player that I love. Let's not forget how great he was. But when he's had that in knee injury, he just hasn't been the same since he's come back. I don't think he's anywhere near the level of player that PSG needs. I don't even think he could be a bench player for PSG at this point in his career. So if he's got to be out there because of injuries, I think that the defense is just going to get eaten up by these younger, faster league on players. What are your thoughts on that? No, that, that's a good point. And um, I, well, I'm trying to think, do you know uh, how soon it's going to be until Nuno is back? I'm not, I'm not quite sure actually, but yeah, no, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, it was, man, I was a little surprised. I know that Danilo and Juan Bernat are not the fastest guys ever, but they did get beat on a couple balls over the top, like the goal. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Jabu was six foot five, so you don't expect him to have blistering pace. Yeah, yeah. No, I know the the back line was pretty slow, and not that you know, not that Marquinhos and Sergio Ramos are are quick by any means, but uh, just uh, their anticipation's a bit better than those guys. And I just think overall, yeah, that was a, a tough game to lose, but I, I don't think we should put a bunch of stock in it. Uh, as long as we've got our, you know, most of the guys that were injured, um, you know, last week, if we've got them back in a week or two, then I think we'll mostly be okay. I think it'll be good for Killian to come back from, you know, international break. And he's done well in the first game against the Netherlands uh, two days ago. And, you know, Messi uh, is doing really good. Messi almost had a hat trick of free kicks in that game against Panama. And you might just say, you know, it's just Panama. But, I mean, to, he, he had a you know free kick goal and uh, two that hit the, the the woodwork. So I just think this this could be uh, a good break. You know, I know the World Cup break probably kind of hosed us. You know, everyone's form dipped. And a lot of guys, their motivation that they previously had probably, you know, fell a bit coming back to Paris after that. But um, I think – if Galtier is a is a decent coach at all, and I still back him, but if he's a good coach at all, I think he'll find a way to use this break in a meaningful way, in a way that'll help us. So I, I'm hoping we're coming back from it 
somewhat good. But the thing is also about the the title race with Marseille is, um, you know, I was talking to my buddy uh, that I stayed with when I was in Paris, you know, for the Champions League match and the Lille match in, in February. And I was, you know, we were talking about this, the title race, and he said, um, I would typically agree that, you know, Marseille might, might have a chance, but it seems like this year, every time that they get a really winnable match, a match that they should be winning, it's just like they just find a way to drop points. Um, I don't even think they deserve to win the match uh, against Reims the other day. You know, they finally handed Will Still his first Liga loss. Um, I mean, uh, Balogun had a shot that hit the woodwork in literally the last seconds of the game. So if that shot is a foot, you know, six inches to the right, then Marseille would have dropped points too. So I just don't think they, they're consistent enough to really challenge us at the end of the day. Ethan, let's change gears here a little bit because there's been some drama at a club that you wouldn't expect it, Bayern Munich. So apparently while they were running circles around PSG in the Champions League, uh, behind the scenes the club was negotiating with Thomas Tuchel to become their manager and Julian Nagelsmann uh, was sacked. They're currently one point behind uh, Dortmund in the Bundesliga and obviously they beat PSG so they're into the uh, next round of the Champions League but apparently at Bayern that is not good enough. So what does it say about PSG that they couldn't even defeat a side that was undergoing this sort of turmoil mid-season behind the scenes and PSG couldn't take advantage of that? How, how bad does that look? And if you want to comment on the, the situation itself at Bayern, um, feel free. Yeah, so it's um, I would actually maybe disagree when, uh, when you said, you know, a club that we might not expect some drama out of. Uh, people in, in Germany do call Bayern FC Hollywood for a reason. Uh, you know, it's it's a very well-run club, and they know exactly what they're doing. But uh, there is always, you know, there seems to be more weird drama behind the scenes than you would expect. Um, I personally, I mean, my thing is not that, not that Gaultier is a better coach than Julian Nagelsmann, but if we had the chance to get Thomas Tuchel right now, even even though we've got what I would say, Galtier is a, a pretty good coach. And Nagelsmann's better, but regardless, they're they're a tier below what Thomas Tuchel is. I think you, it's not a bad, it's not the worst idea to go and and get him, even though uh, Nagelsmann's been pretty good for them this year. I mean, I guess we'll see if that you know comes back to bite them. And we do know that Tuchel is is a manager that typically doesn't last more than two and a half seasons at any one club. So I think this is a bit of a risky move from them, but I could totally see, you know, with their upper management, um, with, you know, the guys that, that lead the club, uh, like, like the ones, uh, you know, picture that we've seen all the tweets. Uh, I cannot remember, I'm spacing on this guy's name for the life of me, the one that was on the left there. Um, I can't remember his name, but just the upper, the upper management of Byron, like it's a bunch of former players, but uh, yes, clearly they, uh, you know, something going on behind the scenes. And uh, it just, if, if there's already sort of this, this weird little conflict or tension with Nagelsmann and uh, this has kind of been heard in the past, then I don't, I'm not super surprised that they jump on the chance to get, to get to cool because that is probably an instant, you know, instant improvement in the uh, manager. Although I do wonder if it's going to be kind of weird to try and win the dressing room just after, you know, Nagelsmann's got a perfect Champions League record. They didn't allow goals to us, Barcelona or Inter. You know, um, Barcelona and us. You know, some of the top, probably top ten teams in the world. Maybe we're not a top ten team right now, but you know, consistently, you know, over you know the seasons. Um, yeah, just kind of weird. I mean, I would say though, there. I think there's more drama at Bayern than than we expect. I think if we asked a uh, a Bayern fan or a German fan. You know, what's what's it like? What's the atmosphere like at, at Bayern Munich? I think they would say, like, it's actually more dramatic than you think. Uh, but I will say the difference probably with, with them and us is that, well, first off, they're run well and our club isn't. But then the second thing is their media typically backs them, whereas ours doesn't. But honestly, I bet a lot of the same stuff that happens at PSG happens there behind the scenes too. So I could be wrong. I really don't know, you know. I don't know the club that well, but uh, just from what I've heard, it, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, and I think the the guy you were uh, referring to is that Oliver Kahn there. Yeah, I think you're right. I, th yeah. I think I think I think that is Kahn. Yeah, I think you're right. 
Yeah, and and you're right. I think wasn't it the year that they got to the finals against PSG? Didn't they fire their manager mid season, or was that somewhere around there that they fired no. their manager mid season and and then went on to do really well in the Champions League? So. You're right. It is so well run and so buttoned up that you don't really hear too much of the drama like you do at PSG. But so that's why it's a little bit surprising. But really, if you kind of look at their history, you're right. That's a that's a good point that you make. That it is a little bit of the German Hollywood FC there um, over at Bayern. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see. You know, Tuchel definitely wore out his welcome at Dortmund. Certainly wore it out here at PSG. Then wore it out his welcome at Chelsea. So we'll have to see how long he remains at Bayern. Let's not forget that Bayern also paid to get Nagelsmann out of his Leipzig contract, if I'm not mistaken, and then gave him a big deal and then, you know, sacked him. So they got to pay that out. So several million euro that they now have to pay for Nagelsmann, who's just going to walk away after, you know, he certainly could win the Bundesliga this year and and he could win the Champions League. There's no great team out there. And they certainly, if you're going to say there is a great team, I would say that Bayern this year in the Champions League is probably one of them just because they... I mean, with all the firepower PSG has, they we couldn't even score a goal against them. So, very it's it's a head scratching decision. They must see something in Tuchel that you know maybe even other big clubs PSG included maybe haven't seen yet. Because uh, yeah, or maybe just Tuchel really wanted to go back to Germany. We know how much he didn't like it in France and you know the scheduling of the games and that sort of thing. And I'm sure he had issues in the Premier League as well. So, Tuchel's back home in Germany. We'll see how he does. Um, it'll be interesting. I want to stay kind of looking big picture here and looking around Europe because you look at the Premier League, you've got Arsenal uh, in the lead there. We mentioned Dortmund is in first place in the Bundesliga. And you look over in Serie A and you have Napoli. And so all three of those are noteworthy sides, certainly with their history. Uh, But you wouldn't say that they are the top club in, in each league. Maybe in the Premier League, you think Manchester City or Manchester United, uh, Liverpool, certainly. Same in Bundesliga, Bayern Munich, of course. And in and, and Serie A, you would think maybe AC Milan. Um, but so what I want to ask you, Ethan, is, is there a revolution going on in football right now where you see these teams are building through their academy, that they're making smart signings as opposed to what PSG and, and Manchester City are doing, which is buying the, the biggest superstars, the best and brightest. Um, you know, look at Chelsea as well. You know, they're big spenders in their mid table. Uh, Liverpool struggling. So is do you see a revolution right now going on throughout Europe of teams building through academy, making very smart signings, having smart football people in charge? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, and I could be wrong here, but just from the way I look at it and, you know, I've got a, uh, I've got a somewhat decent sports background. You know, I've, I've worked in a pretty, you know, large, you know, big college uh, D1 collegiate sports. So it's not quite the same as European football, but just from, you know, I've got a little bit of a sports perspective, I think being, you know, having spent time in these front offices a little bit, the way I see it, uh, looking at, you know, the global football uh, climate is, I think this probably started when, when COVID hit in, you know, February or March of 2020. And as soon as these teams knew they were going to have a massive loss in revenue, I think a lot of these teams had to think, you know, we're not going to have quite as much money to spend the next couple of years. We're still going to be kind of trying to get back to, you know, where we were in 2019 or earlier. And I think that has forced a lot of teams to, you know, they have to outsmart and and they have a, a better chance to outsmart the teams that just spend a lot of money. Um, I mean, we made the final in the COVID season, but since then, I would say teams in Liga have often looked a little better than us. You know, they're just not as consistent. They just don't have the the depth because they don't have the money. But it feels like teams like Marseille and then, you know, Rennes and, I mean, Lyon has struggled for so long. But a lot of those kind of teams that are always competing for Europe, they're not winning the league over us, but it seems like they're getting smarter. Liga is getting tougher. And I think, you know, all the other top five or six or seven leagues – are experiencing that as well. So I think the ones that have kind of emerged, like Arsenal, Napoli, uh, Dortmund have been better because I know right around the COVID time they were struggling. I think they got third one year. I think Leipzig maybe finished higher than them. Uh, I could be wrong. But, you know, just these teams are are getting better because, yeah, I do think a lot of it is focusing on the youth, especially uh, the Bundesliga is pretty youth-centered. So uh, these guys 
Like, I mean, we know Jude Bellingham has been at Dortmund for a while, but guys like that, they've been giving them more chances and it's paid off. But they've also just, I think the main thing is they've been spending their money a lot smarter. Um, you see clubs like, you know, Manchester United, they're finally just getting back into it. Uh, Ten Hag is, is doing good. But for a while there, they, they I mean, if you look from like 2012 onward or 2014 onward, Manchester United are the biggest transfer spenders in the world. Uh, we're top five. And obviously the last decade hasn't really been that kind to either of those clubs. So yeah, you have seen a lot of these clubs. Um, I mean, Benfica are always super smart spenders. They make so much money. They actually lead the world in, um, you know, uh, what is it? Sales from, from players, you know, uh, transfer sales. They lead the world in that, you know, the last like 10 years, you know, if, if you look at 10 years collectively. And I think they've just had to spend uh, spend smarter, you know. I mean, everyone thought Napoli was going to, uh, you know, kind of, I think they finished last year in fifth or sixth. No, they finished fourth because they're in the Champions League this year. They finished fourth, and I think people thought they'd drop into Europa League spots because they had to sell a lot of guys. They had to sell Koulibaly and others. And these dudes that they they spent, you know, 10 15 million on uh they've got that i think he's that south korean center back that dude's been a monster for them he's surprisingly quick uh and then also the guy the georgian guy whose name i'm not even going to try and pronounce i know he's been all over the headlines but i don't know how to say his name so if you're listening you probably know who i'm talking about the georgian guy at napoli they spent i think 10 million on him Um, teams are i think they're investing more in scouting and they know that in order to win you know not, they're not going with like a money ball tactic um, if, you know, we know what money ball is. But they, they know that if we're going to compete with these teams, if we're going to try and not drop out of obscurity, then we have to spend smarter. And I think those teams have really nailed it. Uh, I think some other teams are, oh, I cannot remember where where Thiago Mata is coaching right now. I know he was at Spezia last year. I think he's at Bologna, maybe. I, I believe it's and, Bologna, and, and he won uh, Manager of the Month in December or January. Yeah, Sometimes yeah, that's. Recently. I was gonna say that. Yeah, he won Manager of the Month there lately. They've been spending really smart, and they beat Juve, or no, they beat Inter a couple weeks ago, and they're just another club that you know, even though they don't have any sort of the money near Napoli, you can see even teams with very little money like Bologna. Uh, you know, rising up to like, I think they're actually competing for European spots, if I'm not mistaken. So I just think if you if you can spend your money smart in football nowadays, uh, even if you have very little to work with, you can at least almost be a, uh, you're a challenger for Europe. So I want to know that what, outside of what I said, do you, do you see anything else that maybe I didn't identify? Yeah, well, first, I, I love that point about COVID and teams have to be very smart with their finances. I think that's a great point. I also think that PSG over the last decade has sort of laid the groundwork to show that spending tons of money on, on big names doesn't automatically lead to success. If it did, we'd have several Champions League trophies in the cabinet, um, but we have none. I I also think that players are just so much better these days, and I think the margins between the best players and everyone else isn't maybe as big as it was back in the 70s 80s and 90s i just i think that training and diet and exercise and and just all of that and how everything has just become more professionalized i just don't think the margins are that big anymore so yeah so maybe like teams like psg and others who can afford those bigger uh big name players that are the best players I i think that's why over a season they will ultimately win because they do have that quality. But as we're seeing in League One, they don't have that quality of player. But like Rank can come in on one day, and because they want it more, they can beat us. It, we kind of were talking about March Madness earlier today, uh, or earlier, you know, in the show. And and you see FAU, SDSU, these teams. Why are they able to beat teams that are you know Kentucky, Purdue, you know these number one teams? It's because on one day they have athletes too, and I just don't think the margins are as big anymore. And so when we get into the, the you know Coupe de France and, and the Champions League where it's one or two games, I think that's why these these teams that maybe don't have the names and the quality, I think that's why they're able to beat us. And so I think that what we're seeing across Europe is players are getting a lot better, the margins are getting a lot finer, and it comes down to good coaching and a little bit of luck. Um, and unfortunately, PSG hasn't always had that. And so I think that's 
maybe a little bit of what we're seeing is that over a season, the bigger teams are probably going to win out. But in the Champions League, it's it's really anything can happen. Who wants it more? What manager is going to get the right tactics? It's not always going to be who has the biggest name, who has the best players. That's kind of my yeah. on it. Yeah, I think that's actually that's a perfect point. I wish I had thought of that. Uh, I think that also if you look at the wages of the top footballers in the world compared to sports like the NBA and the, the NFL, you know, and then if you just even look at sports outside of the U.S., um, you see in the you know U.S. for sports, the top players, I think, make a lot more money. You know, like an elite quarterback in the NFL, Pat Mahomes, um, you know, this year Jalen Hurts was super good. Guys like that, they, they're making 45 plus million a year. You don't really see players in football making that kind of money. You look at, uh, you know, I think we'd call Luka Modric one of the best midfielders of all time. I think he makes 20, 25 million a year at Real Madrid. You look, I mean, outside of PSG, I mean, you know, because we uh, typically, you know, classic PSG, we overspend, we overpay our players. Uh, but outside of, you know, Eminem at PSG, there, I think the next highest paid player is Eden Hazard from mm. Real Madrid. But you look at, you know, all these world class players, you're thinking, you know, how much did Prime Zlatan make? He made 18 million a year. How much does current, you know, Lewandowski, I think who's, I think he's winning the La Liga Golden Boot right now. He's on like 22 million a year. I do think that, yeah, you're right. Even though these players are world class and they're so well known, the the margins are not as large. And I think we see that in the salaries as well. So I just thought I'd point that out. But I think that's spot on. Yeah, it's like, it's kind of like, how, how much better is a Lewandowski compared to Balogun? Lewandowski has the wages, he has the name, but when you really think about it, I just don't yeah. think Lewandowski is that much better than Balogun. I just don't. I agree. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I don't think, uh, you know, even Messi and Mbappe, I don't think Messi and Mbappe are mm -hmm. that much better than Bukayo Saka or, you know, Angel Di Maria, you know? Yeah, I'm yeah. with you. I, I think the what we think in our head, or at least you see on social media where these guys only ever yes. get talked about. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, the dudes that are just in that tier below them, I agree. Probably not as big of a difference as we would think. I think off, oftentimes, too, is uh, maybe you and I are more prone to think that's not the case just because it's not that way in American sports, and especially like the NBA, where the NBA is run by superstars, where the gap really is that that much bigger. So, uh, no, yeah, that's, a, that's a, a perfect point, though, I think. Yeah, and I also, you know, thinking about just the college system here in the United States when players are coming out of high school, oh, it's a five-star and this kid's a three-star. But then after a few years of college, that three-star is able to um, get to the NFL because they've developed, whereas the five-star thinks he's all that and doesn't practice as hard and then he doesn't make the NFL and you know so on. So it's like, just because you have a name, just because you have a star, just because you have a salary, I just don't think that a lot of times, unless you have a special talent like a Ronaldo or a Messi, obviously those are just world-class players. But by and large, across Europe, footballers, I don't know if the margins between player to player are that big anymore. And when you get into the Champions League and one-off games and you need a goal, it really comes down who's hungrier, who's who's going to be more determined, who wants that goal, who wants the win, and what manager can put it all together. Who's got A lot of it's like the team chemistry, too the pieces that come together you may have a bunch of three star players but if the chemistry is really good they'll beat a bunch of five stars who are bickering and arguing with each other so there's a lot of things yeah. that go into it yeah no i agree and i think we actually talked about this before we started recording uh if anyone watches the mls uh st louis they're they're a brand new expansion team and right now it's very early just five games in but they're actually top of the uh total mls table and and uh, I was asking you today because I know your your real Salt Lake played them yesterday and lost and they <laughs> lost four nil and I'm thinking you know I know the names of players at Real Salt Lake but I don't really know anyone at St Louis but you, you were telling me that they've just got this system the manager has got it all together they play this really good high press they make teams pay and you know MLS back lines which aren't as athletic. They know how to exploit that. So, yeah, I totally agree because I don't think St. Louis has any star players, but it's just if if the managers got it all together. And I think that's often – I mean, Bayern have had really good teams, and 
I think last year, Real Madrid, I mean, they've got world-class players, but I do think it was more of the collective cohesion and unity of the team that won them that title. I mean, yes, Luka Modric had star moments. Kareem Benzema had star moments. But for the most part, you know, 90% of the success, you got, you got to say, was just the collective overall teamwork. And I think it's clear at PSG we don't have that kind of cohesion and teamwork, which is why we haven't won the Champions League yet. You know, it's funny to look back at the teams, and I know we might be a little running close on time, but I'll just say this real quick. It's funny to think that the team that made the Champions League final for PSG was, it wasn't, you know, the, the star-studded teams of the 90s with George Weah and Rye and, and you know, other guys like that. Uh, and it wasn't this current m M&M. It was the team that had Tilo Kerr playing right back in the final. Herrera and Paredes were starting. Juan Bernat was starting at left back. Verratti was hurt. Mbappe was hurt. And you just look at those teams and you're like, that that team on paper is not as good as what we have right now at PSG. But Thomas Tuchel just had a plan. He just knew what to do. That team had per, you know almost perfect cohesion. And I mean, we could have won that final. You know, it's just, it's tough. A one off game didn't go our way. But we, you could argue we were the best team in Europe that year. It, it was us and Bayern. And, um, but those, that was a perfect example of that final of those teams just had cohesion and they just had it together. I also think the semifinals, being that Lyon made it, they beat Man City that year. They had the same sort of thing. They're not as talented as Man City, you know, Pep's Man City, but. Leon just just had it figured out. And Leipzig also had a good run too, you know, where we beat him in the semis. So, yeah, I think I would, uh, yeah, I just want to throw that out. You know, I think some people agree with me on that. Yeah, and you mentioned the cohesion member after, you know, coming back and beating Dortmund, they run up to the stadium and the fans are out there. There was something special about that season that was more than just the players on the pitch. It's just like yeah. all of Paris was coming together. So you it just, was. you got to have that chemistry. They clearly enjoyed each other and they were, fighting for a bigger purpose um, and that propelled him to the final. So hopefully we can get back to that. Let's get to um, here. We got a few more topics we want to cover before we get out of here. So the big news out of the international break was Kylian Mbappe being named captain of France. So simple question to you, Ethan, should PSG make Mbappe captain? And what would that mean for Marquinhos? Obviously he wouldn't be captain, but do you think that that means he has to be sold? Cause it's kind of a demotion. So how, how do you think he would take that? Yeah, so if Marquinhos was demoted, I I think that could be that could be tough on him. I think probably sixty percent chance that he would want to leave the club, just because I don't know he's been there a while. That that could be a sort of a shot um, to his ego. And I know people use the word ego oftentimes negative, but I think the ego of a footballer is pretty important. It, it you know that's where a lot of the confidence can come from, and that you know he's been low on confidence. We've seen that just through some of the, the soul-crushing mistakes that he's made in the Champions League. And that just might be, you know, not. I guess it's not just a straw that breaks the camel's back, but that could be kind of the final straw for him, I think, in, in maybe just saying, all right, maybe that maybe I should just wrap it up here in Paris. And um, But we have seen that Mbappe has really good leadership capabilities. Uh, he, you know, during the World Cup final, he was the first guy to celebrate – his teammates' accomplishments. He was the first guy to console their mistakes. But I do think that that France and PSG are kind of different beasts. I'm I I don't think we see, you know, in the past we've we've seen Mbappe sulk a little bit on the pitch at PSG and you know be frustrated at times. I haven't seen him act sort of the same way with France. So I'm not quite sure. I think he could be a good captain. It's hard for me to say. I think he could be a really good captain at, at PSG. But being that we, we're almost all certain he's not going to be a one-club man. I know he was already at Monaco. But from here on forward, he's not going to be a one-club man. Maybe it's not the greatest decision. But if he is really willing to you know, tell QSI, hey, because he and Campos have a great relationship. Campos is basically the one who discovered him and brought him to Monaco way back in the day even when he was getting offers to go to Liverpool, Chelsea, uh, you know, uh, Real Madrid, you know, other like big clubs like that. And he went to Monaco instead because he saw it as his family saw it as the, the quickest path into 
the first team of a, a big a, a big uh, club in Europe. And I think if QSI is willing to commit to Campos, basically, if Killing and Campos can be like, hey, we're a joint package. If Campos leaves, then I'm not going to want to stay here. I know that's a bit, you know, that might seem like a negative thing, uh, you know, as a club that we should be kind of open-minded and willing to make changes. But I do think that that that, do, that partnership of Mbappe and Campos, uh, although it's really odd because it's not a player, uh, you know, duo, it's a player and a sporting director, essentially, uh, duo. But I think those guys together, I think if they're here a long time and they both commit the next five years to PSG, which I don't think they honestly would, if I had to guess, I don't think they would. But if they did, then I think that could be really beneficial. And I, I would make uh, Killian captain uh, in that case. But other than that, I, I do think since we can't rely on Killian being here for, you know, the next uh, five years, I think something's got to happen where, yeah, we need to reevaluate if, you know, if Marquinhos is going to remain captain, what do we need to do to make sure he's going to be a reliable leader? And if it's not going to be him, then who's it going to be? And, um, yeah, like I said, I, I, ideally it would be great if it was Killian. I'm just not sure if he's reliable enough. You don't want your captain leaving after, you know, a couple of years. We don't want something like Inter Milan right now where, you know, Skriniar was their captain and they had to remove him as captain once he committed to going elsewhere. So it'd come to us this summer. And now it's just this whole weird dynamic and um, probably just not good for team chemistry, which is why I, I have Benfica beating them in the quarterfinals uh, this next round. But I don't know. What do you, is there a player that you have in mind where you're thinking, yes, this current player at PSG might be a really good fit or, you know, what, what is your solution? Yeah. So, well, first you mentioned screen yard and we're not going to get into that topic, but apparently he's got a busted back and probably won't play for the rest of the season at enter. So I like your pick of them being upset, but um, moving on from him, I, I think, Making Killian captain of France makes sense. Look at his performance the last two World Cups. I think it's a no-brainer. It's not often that you see an attacking player with, with the armband. So um, bold choice from that perspective, I suppose. But I think it, it makes the most sense. He's clearly the best player. Everyone looks up to him. Um, it's his It's his team. And I think at PSG, it's the same deal. Um, he's the best player. Um, he's from Paris. I think you have to make him... The captain at PSG. Now, what does that mean for Marquinhos? He's obviously been lacking confidence. I'm on the record saying I would listen to offers for everyone except for Nuno Mendes, Hakimi, and Mbappe, and that and that includes Marquinhos. I would listen to offers for him. I believe his contract, I'm looking up, expires in 2024. I think now would be the perfect time to essentially give him that demotion, take the captain's armband, give it to Mbappe, and that basically says. Uh, you know anyone in the Premier League, Liverpool, Chelsea, whoever, if you're interested, make us a, a really good offer. Let's not forget that PSG needs a complete rebuild, and they don't really have that many players that they can sell for um, a high transfer fee. Marquinhos would be one of them if they were able to move off of him this summer. So I think that demotion would essentially signal to the rest of Europe, hey, we're listening to offers. So I think that would be good. And then as far as Mbappe being the captain, you're right. He he's not under contract for that many years, but I almost see him kind of like with the like LeBron James here in the NBA, where he only signs one or two year deals. He likes to keep his options open, but I think ultimately, Mbappe wants to do something special at PSG. We've heard him say, "I want to be part of a project." If he sees Campos bringing in, and we'll talk about you know some of the players that are being rumored. I think those are the right players, and Mbappe may want to sign up for that. He may be at PSG for the rest of his career. It made all the sense in the world for him to leave for Real Madrid, and he decided not to. He has political influence. He has more money than he could ever want. He has um, influential power at PSG where he can hopefully build a team and influence the team decisions around him. I don't know if he would get that anywhere else. And as we've always said, winning a Champions League at PSG would be much higher on his resume than winning it, say at Liverpool or Real Madrid or anywhere else where he could go, where it's already been done before. Winning it at PSG would be the most meaningful. So I say give him the armband, give him everything you can give him to keep him at the club. Hopefully he keeps signing two, three-year deals and, and let's do something special and let's listen to offers from Marquinhos. That would be my, my plan. 
Yeah, that's that's not a bad uh, that's not a bad solution. Um, I guess you're right. You know, I think a lot of the part of him not going to Real Madrid was uh, I think he might be more concerned about his image and his image rights uh, more than Great anyone point. else. I mean, yeah. I know. I think if if any of you guys haven't seen it, I think it was the Athletic. Uh, or one of their subsidiaries, they made a, a good video uh, like a week or two ago on, you know, I think it was called the controversial business of killing Mbappe. And I think it's actually a good watch if any of you uh, haven't seen it or haven't heard of them. I think the image rights is, you know, a, a little more important than we've all, you know, maybe given it credit. Uh, I think if if he went to Real Madrid, he was probably going to have to give up 50% of image rights. And we've already seen him for France. He's refused to be in, uh, you know, ads for KFC or Budweiser or stuff like that. You know, anything that he's not, not a really, you know, strongly for, uh, he hasn't wanted to be a part of it. I think also in that video, it pointed out that his, his brand, the Kylian Mbappe brand that his parents and him created, they've actually got a, a uh, company. Um, I learned a lot of this from the video, although some of it was already, you know, per- fairly common knowledge before then. But uh, the company that they use to create his brand, that basically runs his social media, um, they only have a couple partners that they that they you know team up with. So he's really selective on where he's going to go and what he's going to do and who he's going to work with. Uh, maybe more than any other player we've ever seen. And I do think that QSI being 100% willing to give him those image rights, be like, hey, you can do whatever you want. We'll do whatever it takes to keep you here. Whereas Real Madrid, maybe, you know, this is overall, this is for the betterment of Real Madrid. Overall, in the long term, this is a smart move from them to not completely sell out on any one player. But in this case, it worked against them to where they probably didn't get Mbappe largely because of that. Obviously, you know, it worked in the Galacticos era. took some time, but uh, I'm talking about the first Galacticos era in the early 2000s. Um, That worked well for them. You know, they took the image rights, and these players were willing to go there, but football is just a bit different now. Social media has blown up since then, and it's just not quite the same, and I think that that benefited Mbappe to stay here. But I'm, I'm with you. If you make some really good points, if he does believe that, Paris is going to be the best place for his career because I don't, he's not worried about, you see on social media, people call, you know, Liga and the Bundesliga and then any other league basically outside of La Liga and, and England, uh, just call them farmers leagues and that kind of stuff. And, oh, he should challenge himself at a tough league. I don't think that stuff phases a lot of footballers. I don't think they care. I think what you see is he has 60 goals and assists in 67 Champions League games. And, you know, if you remove his first couple seasons where he was still kind of becoming a World Cup class player, then the numbers are even better. So it's clear that he's proved himself on the highest level. I don't think going to, you know, playing a team like Twa or Stade Brestois, I don't think that, you know, it's not like that's any worse than playing Cadiz or Ibar in Spain. Yeah, there's like a couple better teams, but if he's going to leave and kind of sell his brand or reduce his, you know, brand for, you know, to go to a league where you play a couple higher profile games a year, it's just not worth it. So yeah, you make a good point. I hope you're right. Uh, I hope he's going to be, a you know, one of the kind of players that stays in Paris for the next, you know, five, 10 years. Um, I guess if, you know, yeah, if that's going to be the case, then I don't know. I wonder, do you have any further thoughts on what I said? I know yeah. I kind of just repeated what I, you I, said. I, I found that video um, is from the uh, Athletic Interest. It was just published a couple days ago, and it says, you know, inspired by LeBron. And I'm a big NBA fan, and, and one thing I know about LeBron is he wants to own a team. Could could QSI offer him some ownership stake in, in a club like PSG? Could there be something where he becomes – he gets that kind of influential um, – 
power where he has shares in the club or whatever it might be and then after his playing days he could come back and actually run psg i know that's something that lebron james would like to do he'd like to own a team in the nba could mbappe come back i don't think qsi would sell him the whole club i don't even think mbappe would have that much money but you know could he have a, a substantial stake in the club and, and help run it you know his hometown club that could certainly be something that would be i think of interest to mbappe hey stay here and after your playing career we'll we'll give you um some stake in the club that that certainly would be something i think could work out um but i i think you're right the brand the, it's all about the mbappe brand and he doesn't want to go to a club that won't let him do what he wants with his brand and and fair play to him um and a lot of people will criticize psg and be like oh he's bigger than your club i i I just think it's stupid. It's whatever. You know, if PSG are willing to do that and Real Madrid aren't, then we'll keep them. And that's just the way it is. So, um, and you're right. The players don't care about, you know, Messi's never going to play in the Premier League. And he's still the best of all time. And Ronaldo has. And no one thinks that he's so much more substantially better. And you're right. Just a couple extra more difficult games. I also think that Mbappe thinks that within his playing career is probably going to be a Super League situation or something like that. So I think maybe he'll stay at PSG and get to play those more difficult games anyway because I think the football landscape will probably change sooner rather than later. So I think there's a lot of things on the horizon, a lot of unknown. Um, and for now, he's just going to stay where he is, where he's happy, where he gets paid well in his home. And I don't think he has any interest in leaving right now. He says he's very calm, very comfortable where he is, despite you know another Champions League loss. So. Um, Ethan, let's keep it moving here because um, we're coming up. We're about an hour here, but I, I want to get your kind of thumbs up, thumbs down on some transfers and whether or not you think they're going to happen. Are you ready? I can fire them over your way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, let's do it. So um, Javi Simmons, back for 12 million euro. Apparently there's a buyback clause. It was reported by our friends at PSG Hub. If the deal is that simple, PSG have to do it, right? That's a thumbs up or thumbs down. And, and what percentage would you give PSG actually – if that's the clause that they would activate that. Yeah. So whether I want it is a, is a thumbs up. Definitely. I think bring him back and I'm almost even open to assuming that Messi leaves or Neymar, although Messi's more likely I'm almost willing to just throw him into the, Hey, you're going to get a bunch of starts at the beginning of the season and let's see how you deal with it. The odds. I think it happens. The odds. I think he returns to PSG. I'm going to go 25, 30%. I just, I think PSV is going to give him a huge raise. I think the, the level of, of play in the Netherlands is not so much greater than in Liga to where he, he could have a lot more, uh, I don't know. I'm just not quite sure he's going to make that big move to a, a big club in this case, back to a big club. Um, I mean, we, we all know he started at Bar uh, Barcelona. Yep, in their academy. Yeah, and didn't stay there, and then he didn't stay with us. So I don't think he's going to come back, but I would love if he did. I mean, for, for $12 million, if that's all, if it's just, hey, we have a buyback clause and PSG paid $12 million, a player of his quality that you could get back for $12 million, we know that PSG won't have a ton of money to spend without some substantial mm -hmm. player sales. So I think you, you need some depth. You need, if Messi goes... I think if it's only twelve million, definitely bring them back. I don't yeah. know if PSV has any way to stop that, and if they don't, twelve million, there you go, bring them on back. We saw the the picture; he was watching PSG on his phone out at the club mm -hmm. or wherever he was. So he's keeping an eye on um, PSG. So let let's bring him back. So thumbs up for me. Um, all right, next, Ethan, we've got. Let me pull up a photo here if you're watching on YouTube. The the Tarams, as uh, Ethan helped me pronounce. Um, Kefren and Marcus, what do you make of this rumor? Thumbs up or thumbs down from you? Um, I like the idea. I'll go first this time, I guess. I like the idea of brothers at PSG. Um, Kefren, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He's a midfielder, while Marcus is a more versatile forward. Um, Marcus over at Borussia Mönchengladbach, he would be available on a free transfer. So again, kind of a budget signing. We wouldn't have to pay a transfer fee. Whereas Kefren would cost upwards, uh, I think it was on transfer market, they had it about $25 million. So wouldn't be breaking the bank. It's certainly doable for PSG if they're smart with some player sales. So I think they were asked about the idea of both being at PSG and they were kind of laughing. So maybe they know something that we don't. But I... I I think it would be great. They both would fill holes in PSG's squad. Um, you know, they play for the French national team. 
they're obviously good friends with Mbappe. I like everything about this. Um, what say you? Yeah, I I want it really bad. I've there have been two free agent signings that I've really wanted, uh, basically since the you know since we saw problems arise at the beginning of the season, and one of them was Marcus Turam. So I do want him here. Uh, he's he's pretty dang good in the air. He's six foot two. Not that we cross a bunch, but I think we need some sort of aerial threat in the attack. So well, we we do cross a ton, but we don't have anyone that's we, tall enough to get to them. Yeah, we. I feel like all of our crosses they're not they're not crosses intended to meet someone's head. You know, they're low crosses, or we're kind of whipping it in, hoping that it gets a bounce on someone's foot. But yeah, I, I think he would be a really good player. Uh, obviously, like you said, a uh, free agent, I think it'd be huge. And then for Kefren Taram, I, I do think we need to do that one as well. I think he is a, I think he has been sneaky good this season in, in Ligue 1. And obviously Deschamps has, has noticed it and uh, he's in the French squad, but I think that one might cost us up to 40 or 45 million. Uh, that's just kind of what I've been looking at. Now, I did look at transfer marked and, uh, he did have his value at 25, but you know, Nice, Nice are going to up, up the value they're now. They're going to want it. He's under contract till 2025. Yeah. So they're, they're going to yeah. want substantially more. Yeah. Yeah, they are. But I, I am also a huge thumbs up for bringing both of them. I love it. Um, let's see. Okay. Last but not least, we've got Barcelona reportedly, um, our writers over at PSG talk have been churning this one out, but Barcelona have not given up on signing Messi. Um, thumbs up or thumbs down from you. Do you think, and I guess I should change this photo here. It's Let's get it back to us here. Um, do you think that Messi will lower his wages in order to return home to go back to Barcelona? Yeah, I think he would. Uh, I think he. I rem, I think I remember that whole deal when uh, you know end of July, uh, when you know back when but right before he came to PSG, where they were trying to figure out whether he was going to be able to stay at Barcelona, and I think they were offering him like the lowest possible you know, salary that, that would be, you know, not disrespectful. And La Liga even blocked that. But I honestly think that Messi would have been ready to stay at Barcelona for 10, 15 million. I really think he would have. So um, not that, you know, I, I've never been, I know a lot of the fan base really uh, kind of despises Barcelona, but I've never despised him. I respect him. It would be cool to see Messi go back, I think. But most importantly for PSG, we, we need the room in the, the wage bill because he's something like $60 million a year. We just need that that wage opened up, and I just think he's not quite the profile of a player that's going to win us the Champions League. I know that might sound weird thinking, you know, oh, he's he's the GOAT, but I just don't think that uh, just all these old players, it's, uh, you know, and I'm skeptical of Ramos too, which he has been doing better this year, uh, you know, as the season's going on, but yeah, I just think it's time to move on. It was a good marketing thing. You know, we sold some jerseys. Uh, but I think for all of football, for PSG, for Barcelona, for not that it even matters, but, you know, all the messy stands on Twitter, I just think it would be overall best for pretty much everyone for him to go back. And I think he would lower his his wage expectations greatly. I don't know. I can't respect a, a team that's under investigation for paying off refs. And uh, huh. we're, we're over an hour here on the show, and, and we haven't even talked about that. So we'll have to save that for next time, and maybe there'll yeah. be some more news about that. But I like the idea. Thumbs up for me. Hopefully he can reduce his wages and go back home. It's a win-win for PSG. They get his wages off the books, and they send an aging player over to a European rival who will be in the Champions League. And, um, yeah, they send a player who, you know, at times is, is good, but we I think we've seen the best days are certainly behind Messi. So... I think it's a win-win. Hopefully, hopefully he reduces wages, but and goes back to Barcelona. Unfortunately, um, seeing reports on Twitter that Nasser wants to bring back Messi and Sergio Ramos, and my head's just going to explode. <laughs> it's it's so yeah funny. yeah. Well, you know, no one ever said that. Uh, you know, Nasser was the smartest football mind ever. I was actually talking with my buddy recently, and uh, we were just saying that. You know, I think deep down, like Nasser, he's, you know, we've talked about how he's a part of so many different organizations and everything. And we're just, there are photos of him wearing PSG shirts back in the 90s. So we were honestly saying like, man, he, he might just be like us. He, but he was a fan. And, you know, ideally you would love to, man, you know, help manage your favorite team and 
and be in the front office of your favorite team, but he almost might just be like us where we get in there. We don't quite know what we're doing. We're a fan. We have the enthusiasm. We have the love for the club, but we don't have experience doing this. And my buddy joked that, you know, actually maybe, maybe he and I would be uh, better presidents of the club than Nasser. But I, I honestly wonder if it's just, you know, he's got the money and I'm just not convinced. And I've gone back and forth on this in the years, but I'm just not convinced that he's, he's a good president. Just the money that's been thrown around. And I get not everything is, is his decision. I get that the state of Qatar, you know, probably authorized the, uh, the messy signing and, it's not like he has a you know all the power, but um, yeah, I just I, I don't know if he's you know I mean you look at the the infrastructure of Real Madrid, Bayern, clubs like that. They have a bunch of former players, former managers, uh, guys that have been in this business for forever as their presidents, as their GMs, as their sporting directors, and we just don't have the same infrastructure at PSG, and I think it hurts us. Well, we certainly have plenty of former players that could come back and, and help out. We mentioned Tiago Mata earlier in the show. You know, could he come back? Maybe not as manager, maybe an assistant somewhere. Or, I mean, some, something needs to change. I, I think any of the supporters would be a better president than Nasser. We all know what the issues are. We all know the players that need to come into the club, and they just refuse to do it. So, um who knows whether it's him or, or Qatar? Who knows? But Ethan, we got to leave it there. We, you know, I, when I started planning out the show, I'm like, hmm, what are we going to talk about? It's international break, and there's just like there's like four more topics we didn't even get to. So we'll have to save those for next time. But let the folks out there listening know how they can find you on Twitter. Yeah, on Twitter, I'm at PSG underscore Boise. Wonderful. Um, and of course, you can find me at PSG Talk. Uh, make sure to vis visit PSGTalk.com and subscribe to PSG Talk on Substack where you can get premium PSG content for free. Um, I've got a column um, coming out. I'm planning it out. So that'll be in your inbox if you want to go ahead and subscribe. Um, and also, don't forget to subscribe to this fine show. Like, comment, subscribe, um, and uh, hopefully you enjoy what you're listening to. And we'll be back with another show soon. Ethan and I are getting into a nice flow. So thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks, everyone.